thank you all for coming. Um, there are about 25 copies of the report circulating around, so you know, lean over someone's shoulder and read their copy if you don't have it. What I'm going to do today is do a presentation about what the report's all about. So I'm going to go over some highlights, although it's a 20 page report and I'm not going over everything in intimate detail. The report is on the city's website, um, so if you want to, you can go down there and download the report. If you're looking at our website, you have any problem finding it, just send me an email. Um, it's, our website is northamptonma.gov slash OPD. Um, and there's a, it's on the bottom right, there's a link right to it, just click on that one. Uh, and my, my name is Wayne Feiden, I'm the planning director, my email is on that website as well, so you can email me with any questions. Um, so, we're here today to talk about the possibility of extending the Elm Street Historic District up around Hill Road. Um, my department planning office staffs the Elm Street Historical Commission. So they've asked us to prepare this draft report, asked us to do the presentation. It's the Elm Street Historic District Commission who makes the decision whether we go into the next stage. So I just wanted to introduce them or have you all stand up and introduce yourselves. I'm Marisa Lovett, I'm chair of the um, Northampton Historic District Commission, is what we're called. I'm Martha Lyon, and I'm the vice chair of the commission. Edie Ambrose, I'm the architect. Yeah, I'm Bruce Kravisky. I'm also an architect and a member of the uh, commission, and also a member of the Northampton Historical Commission. And Pauline Felgo is the fifth member who I don't think is to me. Um, and then Barbara Blumenthal, who's back, is the chair of the Historical Commission. So we have two different commissions in town. Historical Commission is sort of deals generally with, with citywide history issues as well as demolition delay. Historic District Commission deals specifically with the Elm Street District and if it gets expanded with whatever district it is. So I, I'm going to walk you through this. I have just a few slides, seven or eight slides, sort of that, that are a summary of what the report is and then take whatever questions or comments people have. Um, so the process is the Historic District Commission. Um, received some requests from residents in the neighborhood to think about expanding the Elm Street District up um, Round Hill Road. They spent some time studying it and come up with this draft report. This is the first step in the process. So you are, you know, the early steps of looking at this and saying, does it make sense to go to the next step? Um, after hearing your input, the Historic District Commission will meet again. They will either do nothing or revise the report. And, and start the formal process. Once they revise the report, introduce what's called a preliminary study report, that report gets sent so it's out on the web so the neighborhood can see it. It gets sent to the planning board for comment. It gets sent to Mass Historical for comment. We get all those comments. We come back. They have another public, a formal public hearing. This is sort of an informal process. There's a formal public hearing later in the process. Again, if they like what they hear, they adopt the final report. That final report goes to council, and council gets to vote this up or down. So for this to go forward, the district has to vote on it basically twice, and has to go before council. Our structures, we have a nine-member council. It takes six positive votes. So if less than six councilors want to go forward, even if everybody else in the world loves it, it doesn't go forward. If six councilors love it, and everybody else in the world hates it, it goes forward. So that's, that's the ultimate decision-making power. Everybody else is involved with, with advising. Um, I wear sort of many hats, so my office makes no decisions whatsoever, but we advise lots of people who do make decisions. So we advise the Elm Street Commission, we would be advising City Council, the Planning Board reviews this, um, and everyone has different perspectives, and our job is to bring those different perspectives to the table. So I'm just going to go through this again. I'll go through this fairly quickly. If there's straight informational questions that have absolutely no bias whatsoever, and you want to interrupt and ask me, that's fine. We have lots of time for discussion later, so when you, you know, don't, I don't want to hear leading questions, those aren't information. At the end, you can ask all the leading questions and whatever information you want. Um, so, Elm Street Historical, uh, is there, one thing in terms of terms, we have a historic district. Um, that's the formal thing that's on the books. It happens to cover, right now, only Elm Street, so we all refer to it as the Elm Street Historic District. And that's the way we've been referring to it since this was passed two years ago. Um, just a little history and order. The historic commission, you know, Barber's committee, proposed a few historic districts a dozen years ago, well before Barber was on it. Um, and there's actually some opposition to it. 
And so those districts didn't go forward, including Elm Street. Then, many of you know the story, there was a pretty hideous expansion of the house on Elm Street, and that got the neighborhood very involved. And then once it became a neighborhood-involved process, it went forward and the district that finally passed came out of this neighborhood process. So, you know, the lesson from, from that for all of us is we need to do as much involvement with you all as possible. This is an extra meeting, this isn't the formal public hearing, but we want to get you all involved in this process early on, you know, so that, that we build as much consensus as possible. We've also met with Clark School, we've also met, met with the potential developer, um, we've met with Smith early in the process. We will meet with anyone, anytime, because we want as much dialogue as, as we can in this process. We've met in Jonas's house a couple times with lots of people from the neighborhood. We had a lot of informal meetings. So you know, it's been trying to get as much outreach as we can in the process. So this is the existing district along Elm Street. It's probably hard to see where you are in the graphic, but basically it goes from church to church. So the high school is not within the Elm Street Historic District, but the church right next door to the high school, sorry, the church right next door to the high school is in the district, and it begins right at the edge of State Street at the church there. Um, and this district is basically one building wide. So the idea when this is adopted is we're really trying to get that section of the city, which is extremely visible to people going down Elm Street. Elm Street's a you know, major quarter downtown, a major quarter of the rest of the city. It's important to preserve the history along it. You know, Smith College is regulated only those buildings right on Elm Street. The rest of the Smith College campus is not. Likewise, <coughs> private homes are regulated if they're on Elm Street, but further back is not. Um, and so we've talked on and off about expanding Elm Street, frankly, from the day it was passed. Um, so there's been discussions. There was a public meeting two years ago now um, that the Historic District Commission had looking at other possible expansions. Um, so you know, so there's been lots of discussion about that. Um, just think, one thing I need to start with is what does a historic district not do? So in Northampton, it's different in different parts of the country. But in Northampton, we have a lot of exemptions. We have exemptions that the state requires us to exempt. So, for example, under state law, we can't regulate things that aren't visible from the public way. We can't regulate interior layouts of buildings. There's lots of things we can't regulate. But the Northampton has also chosen to add some additional exemptions as well, basically to make life easier for the regulated community. The idea is how do we find that balance between stopping horrible expansions that, you know, compromise the history of Northampton and devalue everyone's property while allowing an ongoing reuse of property. So, for example, if you have an existing window on your property and you want to replace it with an identical window, it used to be you had to come before the commission for a permit. Now you don't. Um, so we have, a, we have a series of exemptions. We don't regulate landscaping. Um, we don't regulate land use. We don't regulate traffic. Some of those things aren't regulated at all. Many of those, particularly, you know, all these things, these bottom three, are regulated by the planning board. So any major project, whether it's a reuse of Clark buildings, any major expansion of Smith College, any other big project, requires a site plan approval from the planning board. Site plan approval, which is not what we're talking about today, but just to give you a quick background, all the neighbors get notified within 300 feet, an ugly orange sign gets posted on the street, an ad gets put in the paper, um, and there's a public hearing before the planning board. And so that's where all those discussions are about traffic and landscape. So there's these regulations which city council passes. And then there's standards. We just adopted a new book. If you live on Elm Street, you would have been provided a copy of this book. At least if you lived there for more than six months, I think. Um, these are detailed standards. The idea is the regulations provide big picture guidance. But when you actually start doing a project, you want to have more guidance as to whether the board is going to approve your project or not. So there's a detailed set of standards. The standards include some things that are mandatory and some things that are advisory. So if you're doing a project which doesn't require a permit from the board in the first place, there's still some discussing that project in these guidelines, but you could ignore that. If you're doing a project which does require approval from the board, then the board's going to look at these guidelines as part of their decision. So they're useful, and again, if you don't have a copy of these, these are at Forbes Library and Lilly Library, and they're on, online on the city's website. And then, you know, I'm not going through this, but the process is fairly simple. If you think your project is exempt, you're replacing a window or you're doing something else that's exempt, 
Um, you can file for a permit that's online. It's a free permit. Staff can issue that permit. If you're filing something that has to go before the full commission, there is a fee. It's currently $200. The process takes about a month, uh, and there's an appeal period afterwards because you have to file. We have to advertise the newspaper. We have to notify all the abutters, um, and then the, the, the commission, full commission meets. And the, the application process is the same. Um, and then Jeremy mentioned we wear multiple hats. But one of the things we look at when we do any sort of project is look at the city's comprehensive plan, look at the overall goals the city has. And so these are some of the goals which, which are relevant for Elm Street and now for, for Round Hill, which is the city's master plan says we're trying to get more housing within walking distance of downtown. Um, it's important from a traffic standpoint. You know, if you live close to downtown, some of your trips are on foot. If you live way out in the western part of the city, almost all your trips are by car. It's important from a valuation standpoint. There's lots of things that, that make that an important goal for the planning board and for the city. Um, second is we're always looking for economic development opportunities, things that generate jobs, that keep Northampton you know, a healthy community. Third is we're very interested in property tax. And we particularly like property tax that we make money on as opposed to property tax projects that we lose money on. Um, Fourth is, and this is obviously why most of you are here, is thinking about historic preservation and how do we enhance historic preservation in a way that makes our neighborhoods more vibrant. Um, this generally we want projects that are well thought out and well designed, so we're not getting schlocky, horrible projects. Um, and then the last one, maybe the other reason many of you are here, is you know, how do we get a strong, vibrant neighborhoods that are out there? There's, you know, this last thing in pink, there's no question in my mind that Clark School reuse could be absolutely wonderful for the neighborhood. Smith College, whatever buildings they sur surplus, could be absolutely wonderful. Um, and that private properties that get redeveloped could be absolutely wonderful. Um, and so I think we all have a lot of faith in, in you all collectively, you know, in Clark School and Opal and Smith College and you all as, as residences, as residential owners, that you can do a great project that's out there. And so the balancing act for us is always, you know, how much regulations you know, are appropriate for people to find some consensus for how we, we design this city. So this is, in essence, I think, what the debate will be going for in the city's standpoint, um, is that you know, we want all those goals I mentioned to be met. And we could do those all by regulations. Um, and you know, it's appealing to say, we want to preserve historic property. Let's have a regulation to do that. There is a cost for regulations whether it's my time because I have to staff the board, whether it's your $200 and your two months. You know, we always find that everyone likes regulations for their neighbors. But when you want to do a project and suddenly it takes a three-month lead time or maybe the answer is no, we don't like regulations. So what's the right balance that's out here? Um, and so that becomes the debate. I, don't, I suspect that there's probably not a person in this room or a person in the city who thinks that we should rate Elm Street or Round Hill and that we don't care about historical buildings. I think, as a community, we have a surprising amount of consensus as to what projects we like. Um, it's, you know, what's the best way to go forward doing this? So that becomes the balance of this. The other thing that, you know, typically when you talk about a historic district, you spend a lot of time talking about the rich history that's there. Um, I'm really not going to do that, because I think it's pretty obvious for most of us that Elm Street has a very rich history, is clearly <coughs> eligible to be a local historic district. And Round Hill has a rich history and clearly could be a historic district. So if people have questions, we can talk about that. But we just, you know, we've done enough of collecting the data, and there's more of it in the report um, to say we know that's true. This is just a list of all the buildings there and when they were built. Um, so I'm not spending time on this, but I think it is it would be very easy to say if the community wants this to be a historic district, it clearly meets all the criteria that are out there. So that's why I'm not spending time on So the discussion the Historic District Commission has had today is thinking about this as an expansion. So here's Elm Street again. Here's the existing district. Here's Round Hill Road. Um, is thinking that we should extend the district up Round Hill Road. So we're including, you know, majority of this is Clark School buildings, but also some, some Smith College buildings, some private buildings, and some private buildings. Here. Um, and that's a logical district. That tells a story. The district could be bigger. Um, you can keep going, it's a very rich neighborhood, you can certainly go, you know, this entire area would be an easy district to justify. The district could be smaller. Um, it seems to be sort of a logical area, at least as a preliminary. 
part of the discussion we want to have tonight is if we are going to do a district, do these boundaries make sense? What sort of alterations will make sense? And then I'm not sure you can read this from where you are, again, it's in the report, but we were just sort of curious what the district, you know, what's the makeup of the district. So the current Elm Street district has 104 buildings, and some of that includes massive buildings and includes tiny little outbuildings. So 104 buildings of any kind, it covers 56 acres. These numbers are all plus or minus because of problems with the census, but about 350 people. Um, the proposed district would add 35 acres, um, I'm sorry, 35 buildings, 22 acres, and 81 people. So the population increase wouldn't be nearly as dramatic as the building increase, which isn't surprising because a greater percentage of this campus is institutional. You know, it's not very but you can see the mix, you know, as we're proposing right now, seven acres is residential, just one acre is Smith, 12 acres is Clark, and you don't care about the some land under the roads themselves. So in the study process, we've made some progress. Again, there's a draft report. We're open to comments. But the first thing this, the study committee did, the, the Elm Street Historic District Commission did, is work with the planning office to think about, OK, what are the things we don't want to do? What are the paths that don't make sense? And so one of them is doing nothing. It did seem like there was some consensus not irreversible, some consensus, that some action is important to make sure that Round Hill remains as vibrant as we all know it and will. Um, the second is just nominating the Federal Register. Federal Register <coughs> has teeth if you're doing a project which requires federal money or a federal permit or state money or a state permit. Um, so if you want to build a bank or if you want to build a prison, State registered district is really important. If you want to get national, uh, federal historic tax credits, it's important. But it doesn't have any teeth otherwise. So by itself, it's an incentive, but it doesn't stop things. Um, we're talking about doing some zoning changes, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes, but zoning alone doesn't save historical buildings. Um, and so zoning alone would be much different than doing nothing. Um, we could create a non-historic district approach. So there's many different kinds of regulations that can preserve the history of an area. So we have one district in town, the Elm Street Historic District. But we also have a central business architecture district, which is not a historic district. It's a different kind of beast. And we have a West Street architecture district, which is not a historic district. So there's another way to regulate. Um, we didn't think it made sense in this particular case. Those tend to be places where you're really open to, to old buildings getting torn down and new buildings being built. Um, you want to make sure the new buildings are really vibrant. So West Street, for example, is less about preserving architecture and more about making sure that new buildings fit in the sort of vision we have for it. I think Round Hill is more interested in preserving the history of this out there. Um, some discussion about should we just include all of Round Hill? So not what I showed you in the sketch. Um, I think the commission felt like that may make sense someday, but that's probably just overreaching now, just in terms of the amount of work, if nothing else. Um, changing the district requirements. So what we're looking at now is a text. We're looking at taking the existing historic district and making the boundaries larger. We're not looking at changing the existing rules. That's very important. If you ask your neighbors, most of you probably live in or right next to the area we're talking about changing. We didn't send a notice out to everybody on Elm Street because we're assuming we're not changing the basic rules of the game we've had for a long time. So existing rules, just a map change. Um, and then trying to protect trees through a historic district, it's not exactly a match. It's not primarily a problem. We have other abilities to do that through other regulations that this consensus we're doing. So where we are right now coming into this public meeting is, is suggesting four things. First is an ideal might be what's called a, a historic preservation restriction. That is, a property owner works with the city and guarantees that a property will be protected basically forever and puts a restriction on the building. Um, we can't mandate these, or basically we can't mandate these. Um, so they're voluntary agreements, um, but they're incredibly powerful when you get these agreements. So when the city sold the old fire station, or on Hatfield Street when they sold the old schoolhouse, um, or on West Farms Road when we sold, sold the old West Farms schoolhouse, we retained historic preservation restrictions. So that means the buyers of those buildings have to follow certain rules the city set forward in the process. Um, and the reason those are certainly desirable often is when you're going through a historic district process, everybody's taking a risk. You know, an applicant applying for a permit gets, re and their, their bank 
gets really worried they won't get a permit. Um, and that uncertainty, you know, scares away some development. The neighborhood also is worried that somebody will get a permit for a really bad project. And so that uncertainty scares the neighborhood as well. Historic preservation restrictions are basically a way to deal with some of those things up front. We all agree on what's being protected, and we agree on what's not being protected. So that's sort of the first choice. The second is, if we can't do historic preservation restrictions, the report, as it says now, says we should expand the district the way I just outlined. The third is that we should change zoning to create additional incentives. So one of the best ways to do historic preservation is make sure that somebody who owns a building can actually use the building and not have it sit empty. So thinking about the zoning changes so that an old obsolete building can get reused is important. Um, and then the last is nominating the site for the National Register so that there are historic preservation tax credits so at least a federally funded project isn't doing bad things there. Um, so these are next steps that we see going forward after today, again depending on what we hear today. The first is that staff at least explore with Clark School and Opal in particular and possibly Smith College on preservation restrictions. Thinking about, you know, is there a way to make this work? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Um, the second is we explore exactly where the boundaries should be. The map I showed is a working map. But we want to go through and see, and I'm going to go back to that slide at the very end, and see is that the, the most logical place for it. Um, the third thing would be this, the commission who, who introduced themselves earlier on today, after they hear their, your comments, is going to sit down as a board, so not tonight, but sit down as a board, think about your comments, think about the report, think about what changes they want to make, and adopt a preliminary report. Then I mentioned earlier, we send our report to the planning board, Mass Historic, we get their comments, comes back to the commission, they issue a final report, and it goes to city council. So that's the outcome of the process. I'm just going to go back to this slide here, and basically, any, let me start with the questions first before the comments. So any questions? Yeah. On the historical preservation restrictions, who's a, who would be a party to it? And City yeah, so the way we need to think about it is ultimately city council would have to approve it. Um, and they could be, it could be any other parties as well, but we'd want city council to approve it. And the city cannot require it though? Well, city so can take it by image domain, but basically no, the city can't require it. So this would be instead of doing a district. This would be an alternative approach. And sort of it's a, you know, it's a negotiated agreement. You know, let's say that there's some buildings that we all think are really important and some buildings are less important, and some facades that are really important, you might reach an agreement on, you know, in essence, work those things out ahead of time. But no, it would be voluntary approach. Uh, back up. Uh, yeah, uh, traditionally, who has been opposed to these in, in the past, and are there any signs that anybody might be opposed to this currently? Opposed here or opposed uh, elsewhere? Yeah, in the city? to uh, the storage district. It's, it's typically landowners. I mean, landowners are, it's the same thing. We want to be regulated. We, we don't want our neighbors to be regulated. We don't. So it's always a mix for doing it. Um, you know, when we did the Elm Street District, Smith College decided at the end their position was to be formally neutral. They neither wanted to lobby and favor it, but they thought they could live with it and they weren't opposed to doing it. Um, there were some neighbors on Elm Street who were vehemently opposed, the vast majority who were strongly in favor. And city council in the end, I mean, city council decided, but they they certainly listen to the neighborhood as a major factor in why they approve this. I just wonder why the community has, um, has said that the, the uh, in negotiation of preservation restrictions is, is the kind of preferred route and the, and the expansion of the historic district is a sort of, uh, you know, plan B. Yeah, yeah. It's a certainty issue. I mean, let's assume for the sake of argument, and I'm not assuming that's a, that's a route that would work, but let's assume for the sake of argument that we could do historic preservation restrictions. What it means is the property owner knows absolutely up front what they can do and what they can't do. And the neighborhood knows absolutely up front what can happen and what can't happen. With a um, historic district, nobody really knows. So for example, some people think that the campus center is not the best building on Elm Street. It was approved through a historic district. I don't think it would be approved the way it was today, but it was approved at the time. So there's some uncertainty. On the other hand, from Smith's standpoint, it was a year and a half or two year process to get that approval. So there's a lot of uncertainty in both directions. Joe? Well, just a point of clarification on that question, though. Depending on how the historic preservation restriction is written, it, it, couldn't it be written 
so that certain types of actions would require yeah, absolutely. city approval, would be a different <coughs> approval, it wouldn't be following, it might be a different process from the historic district, but so it doesn't necessarily provide the same level of certainty. Right, right, it could be either way, you're absolutely right. I mean, it depends on how you draft it, but it is, it, it is a perpetuity, <coughs> which a district is that's right. So, so let me give you one example. When we sold the old fire station on Masonic Street, so we did two things. We said the really character-defining features in that building we don't ever want to lose are the roof lines and the old tower where they dried fire hoses. So the, the restriction we, there, so we got for that set is those are key. You can't touch those. So we want everyone to know that. And then we basically took the Central Business Architecture District and we put them in the ordinance, or we put them in the preservation restriction for all time, basically saying, even if whatever politics there are in the future, we no longer have a central business architecture downtown, we in essence will still for the fire station. So that was sort of a hybrid, what you were talking about. Bruce? Yeah, I think one of the key things, that the difference between the preservation restrictions and the historic district, with the preservation restrictions, that's an individual negotiation, an individual contract between a property owner and the city. Uh, that means if you've got um, you know 35 or 139 buildings or whatever it is, uh, you have to have 139 different contracts. Uh, with the historic district, think of it as more of a collective thing, where it, it's an umbrella set of regulations for everybody within the district, and so you go through the process with the historic district commission uh, to review, recommend, uh, and approve as opposed to have to deal with an individual one-on-one -on -one basis. I think the advantage to the working individually, you can be uh, you're much more strict, you can be much more uh, in a contractual relationship. Uh, with the, the umbrella historic district, you're really working with neighbors who are members of the commission uh, and coming up with uh, you know, solutions that way. But think of it as a, a basket full of individual contracts or one larger umbrella contract. I think it's absolutely true, except one comment is obviously in the basketball approach you may say some buildings don't need them. So. Right. Yeah. A uh, couple of comments. Well, for, let me start saying questions first and then come back to comments later. Unless your comments are really questions about uh, Let me think about whether these are questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, you get your shape. I can phrase them as questions. Let's get legal about it. The, uh, first of all, would the uh, representatives of the community be included in negotiations? So, One, and two, yeah. why couldn't, well, should I save my second question to you have answered? Sure, that? yeah. I mean, the answer is ultimately it's a city council process, so ultimately it's a, it's a political process. So the city council would have to approve. They're making a decision, but clearly they want to hear from their constituents. Would that be after the negotiations or during the negotiations? Well, I think it's before it's concluded. I mean, I'm not sure you're going to have 40 people in a room for every time you sit down, but yeah, clearly it would be part of the process. Okay, second question then is, uh, and I do have to add a comment to make sense out of this question. A uh, problem with just the historic preservation restrictions is that it wouldn't protect the whole area. There are other houses which are of historic value in the area that wouldn't be protected unless you brought everybody in the neighborhood in, uh, in the extension in on the negotiations. So the question is, why not do both? Well, I, I think the why not do both is easy, which is the property owner's motivation for doing historic preservation restriction is saying it's in return for not having to deal with regulations and the uncertainty. Because the incentive for me as a property owner is being certain. So if I was offering a historic preservation restriction, it would be because I knew it wouldn't be there. Let me, let me, if any of you who are New Yorkers or go to New York a lot, you know, what we have in Massachusetts is this historic district approach. New York has this landmark approach. When New York has historic districts, but they also have landmark districts where a building, Grand Central Station, is protected and the entire area isn't. So the idea is you figure out what the crown jewels are, and those are protected and may not be protected. So, what, what I just, let me go to Ruth in the back. I'll come back for comments. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's like exact boundaries, but just to be clear, does this really cover everything visible from that public road? No. No, in some areas it probably covers things so that aren't visible, and some things that probably Elm Street, it's visibility from the public way. Right? Well, not exactly. I mean, Elm Street. Well, I mean, two things. First, we had a building well off Elm Street that was affected. Right. So, what these boundaries are in Elm Street is somewhat arbitrary 
These are the property lines that happen to have been in our records. So these follow the property boundaries. So the district here happens to follow logical property boundaries except for a contour line right there. Um, so the district includes more, but what's regulated, so one of the exemptions is anything not visible from public way. So even if something, if something was built, I don't know the topography well enough, so, so bear with me, I'm wrong. But something was built here which wasn't visible from any of the roads. Even if it's in a district, it's not regulated. But, but comparable, if it's not in that green area, but it is visible from the public. It's not regulated. It's not. Right, okay. right. So the only thing regulated would be these districts within the district, and then some things within them might fall out. So a building sitting right behind one of those buildings, but that you could see from the road, would not be affected. That's right. Or, or even facades. I mean, if any of you live on Elm Street, mm -hmm. if you're suddenly doing, punching out your house for a kitchen, and maybe the front of your house is protected and the rear isn't. So, again, that, forgive me because I don't know the, the topography well enough, but someone might do an expansion on one of these buildings. In front, it would be regulated by a district. In back, it wouldn't be regulated by a district, unless it's a side street. So, you know, poor people who live on Elm Street who happen to be near an intersection are regulated more than people who aren't near an intersection. So. I, I just want to clarify your, your answer. Uh, as I understood what you said, uh, it may be that property owners object to uh, having a historic district and a historic preservation restriction. There's no inherent reason they both couldn't be done if all the parties were in agreement. Absolutely. That's correct. Right. Okay. So, so my example of the old fire station, that is both in what's well, central business architecture, but it's both in a district and it has a preservation restriction. That's correct. Tony, both options involve buildings only. Is that correct? Uh, well, historic preservation restriction in theory could protect land. We don't have any in Northampton, but people do it for cemeteries and people do it for parks, and so it could cover other things. But the um, historic preservation restriction, uh, I believe you said there would be individual contracts that would be negotiated. Um, who would be the parties to the negotiation? So the property owner. With the would, city? Right, so the property owner, the city would hold. So, so the, the city would hold, the city council would have to vote exactly what that process is, clearly it's a political process, we want to hear from the neighborhood, but ultimately it's a vote from city council. Mass Historic Commission has to approve them, but they don't care about what's being regulated, they're approving it more in terms of form, and the property owner has to approve it. Wayne, what happens if 30 of the property owners agree to a historic uh, preservation restriction and five don't? So that's part of the weighing of the process. So, so in essence, what the political process would decide is six councilors, would have to decide is a historic preservation restrictions in those properties better or worse than a district. So the city council would ultimately decide? City council ultimately decide, right. So we would, you know, part of the negotiation is we would work with property owners, but we wouldn't actually execute an agreement until there was an agreement with city council. So I, I'm happy, it's sort of, you know, as comments are getting more, questions are getting more into comments, I'm happy to take either one now. So ask questions or comments. But. Um, Because you know we've read through the, the book of, of things that are regulated, and we have a sense of how the process of regulation occurs. But if the city is privately negotiating with a bunch of individual property owners, and we aren't, you know, we are not collectively part of the conversation about what's being negotiated, in a way, the outcome of that process is is more uncertain, you know, for us because we don't know what. What um, you know, how the negotiations would turn out, or, or what restrictions they would succeed in imposing, and what ones they might not succeed in imposing, and then it sounds like you know the neighborhood collectively isn't uh, making a, it isn't in any position to express an opinion on on those collective restrictions which may have been negotiated. Only the city council at that point is making a decision. So it's it's. I, I feel as though uh, the neighborhood would have less input, less opportunity to be part of the conversation, and therefore, uh, you know, less empowered by the process of trying to impose preservation. Well, let me tell you this the way sorry, I envision it working, which is, in any case, there'll be another meeting coming forward. Yeah. 
Um, and at that point, we'd be presenting either a final report or a formal preliminary report, um, or we'd be presenting a series of historic preservation restrictions. So there would be public discussions before going forward and figuring that out. I mean, either one's right. People, I mean, people may not agree on them, but at least it would be a clear public process before before it goes to city council for that decision making. I'm, I'm going to convert my question into a comment now. Uh, I like the historic district, which Opal has expressed uh, agreement with for, for good reason, I think, uh, because it protects properties other than just the Clark campus. And I like the historic restriction because it can do things that the uh, historic district can't, such as protecting trees and green space. Okay, thank you. Um, from the standpoint of, of cost and time, um, if the city has to negotiate with each individual property owner over each building, um, and particularly if those owners, well, I suppose Clark would have to be one owner, but all the other owners would, they'd have to have their own, probably they'd have, they may have to have their own attorney. There, wouldn't would the actual sort of transaction cost of doing individual deals with each property owner end up being more costly to the city? It, it could. I mean, you know, the city has a goal already of getting more historic preservation restrictions, knowing that regulations aren't as permanent. So some of you may have received a letter from me or from one of my interns because we've done an outreach to people off of Elm Street asking people to donate historic preservation restrictions. We actually got money from the Community Preservation Act to go out to get some of those restrictions. And the idea being they're, they're longer. So yes, but it may be an investment that's worth it because you have a much longer protection. And you may have less uncertainty, so it's, it may be staff time now and all those people's time versus less time during the regulatory process. Wait, can you go back to the option uh, slide for a moment? Yeah, the restrictions. Okay. The expansion of current historic district and the nomination for the National Register in the use of historic tax credits, federal historic tax credits. I think it's important for people to know that in, in order to achieve those, that's a much higher level of scrutiny. It includes the interior of the buildings as well as the exterior facades. But also, the plan has to be submitted to the city approval and, and an approval letter to Mass Historic. In addition, those same plans go under the scrutiny of both the local historic district and the historic preservation of the city and have to be approved by both of those. So you have three levels of scrutiny and approval and then when the project is completed, the historic tax credits, which in this case are, are significant dollars, three to four million dollars, have to be audited that they met the original plan. So if you have a property that's going under a federal historic and tax historic, you have the two local historic districts, the local mayor, the local planning department, all of those have to have approval letters for the plan, plus then you have an audit of what is done for those funds. And it automatically brings a long-term restriction on all of the properties. For, so from a procedural point of view, if there are state and federal historic tax credits being utilized, that's an enormous amount of level of scrutiny in the preservation process, as opposed to these others. And the only personal note I'll make, because it's, it's happened to me on a historic home, when you make a contract for historic uh, restriction, make sure you check with your lender first. You may have a, a, a what we call an SMDA, which is a non-disturbance and atonement agreement in your mortgage, which is standard land language, which won't let you restrict any of your property without your lender's permission. So that's a really important point. It's really clear you understand the language. So it was, if you're a, a National Register Historic District and someone chooses to take advantage of those, this, those tax credits, then you're absolutely right. The projections are incredibly strong. But you could be a National Register District and choose not to take advantage of this. Two comments on that. My understanding, perhaps I'm wrong about this, was that the uh, restrictions related to the tax credit are time limited. What I heard was 10 years. I know that the restriction that they have, the properties have to be rental is five years, and I, I haven't seen anything. But I did hear that it was 10 years. So we could talk about beyond 10 years. 
The second thing is addressing the gentleman's remark there. I don't see it as necessary to have historic uh, restriction, preservation restriction agreements with all the property owners. I'm talking about the Clark campus when I talk about that. The rest, I'd, uh, just speaking personally, I'd be satisfied to see covered by the uh, um, by the uh, historic district uh, guidelines. All right, thank you. I have a question regarding density. Um, you mentioned that any new building might not be covered underneath the restrictions. So is that saying that the Clark School campus could add additional buildings that would adhere to the guidelines? Or did I misunderstand? Well, if you did a historic district, it does cover. So a historic district covers new construction as well. So a local historic district. A preservation agreement can be anything. That, that becomes negotiated. So typically it doesn't. Typically it's only about the existing buildings. But in theory, it could be anything. So, you know, Jonas asked about land. Yes, they could cover. They typically are only for buildings, but they could do it. Does that answer your question? So, with the proposed district, could they, could many more buildings be built on the property? Yes. So, proposed district would, is about the design of the buildings. So, if there was a proposed district, the proposed district would say new buildings have to be designed in a way which is compatible and fits in with the rest of the district. That doesn't mean they couldn't happen. There's no limit to the amount. So what I mentioned earlier about historic districts aren't about land use. Historic districts are not about density, not about uses, not about the amount of buildings. But they are about compatibility. So it often means you have to be create, you know, from a developer standpoint, creative and figure out how do you fit in. So it's not jarring, but if you can do that, there's no limit to it. Zoning has limits, though. Anybody who hasn't spoken yet? Well, ultimately, the Historic District Commission will make a recommendation to City Council, and City Council will vote. So you all know the process. In pure political terms, when something takes six votes from City Council, it means it's a consensus building operation. Right? It's hard to get six votes for anything. And so to get six votes, not that you wouldn't have one outlier council doesn't like something, but usually it's a consensus process. You know, for zoning, for example, I'll tell you, the majority of zoning that we, which is also six votes, the majority of zoning we pass is unanimous with this one person opposed to it. So that's just the reality, the political reality. But practically, it takes six votes of council to make the decision. Would we be able to see some sort of draft of the preservation restriction that the city would be fighting for or their negotiation goals in advance of the decision as to whether to go for the preservation uh, restriction or the historic district? Well, there's two things. One is the agreement itself, which is sort of a, a set form, which we can all show you what the state has. But the more important part is trying to identify, which, you know, as you mentioned, not, we're not necessarily trying to get all the buildings. So the more important part is trying to figure out which are the key buildings and which are the character-defining features of those key buildings. So what are the key things? So, you know, I think that's one of the things that the Historic District Commission needs to talk about is what are those facades that, we want, that are important to preserve. So I think certainly we can share that. I mean, you know, as this process goes forward, that will certainly be a problem. In terms of eligibility for federal tax credits, it's my understanding that if a building is on the National Register, it is eligible for federal tax credits. But only for income producing properties. Right. Only for but if it is, but also properties. if it is uh, part of a local historic district, that also provides for eligibility for tax credits. Someone who's more that, that can clarify that um, a property has to be either individually listed on the National Register of Historic Places or it has to be a contributing property within a district that is listed on the National Register. Um, it, and listing on the National Register is not necessarily the same as a local historic district. For example, Elm Street is a local historic district. Downtown Northampton is a National Register district, but it is not a local historic district. So it, it can be set up any way you want, but you have to either be listed or contributing to the significance of a listed district. And when you nominate a district for the National Register, you have to list all those properties <coughs> that are contributing and those that are not contributing. Okay, I didn't 
did, I thought I read that if you were a member of a local historic district, that that also provided for eligibility. Only if that local historic district is coterminous with a national register designated okay. district. Mm -hmm. And very often the boundaries language. are the same. In most, in most communities they are the same, but Northampton is Northampton. Yeah. The actual language and legislation is it is on the historic national register or eligible. That's that's the other thing. Okay. Uh, if you have a property that is not listed on the national register, but you think it could be, they will give you a determination of eligibility. You will submit the research and everything like that, and even if it's not listed, if they determine that it is eligible. Um, then there are the, the federal and state restrictions apply, but you have to be listed for part of the district to qualify for the tax incentives. But there's a determination of eligibility as part of the process. So if you just take your house and say, you know, I'm very interested, is this potentially significant? You do the research, you submit it to the state. They say, yeah, this appears to be eligible for the National Register. They click that off. And then they say, well, why don't you complete the rest of the application and really get it on there? Uh, there are a lot of nuances to this, and, um, um, and there are changes all the time. And um, please take my comments with a grain of salt, because I'm not that familiar with Massachusetts legislation. I'm more familiar with other states. Uh, maybe this is too specific at this point, but you mentioned uh, if it's uh, if, uh, Round Hill were in a historic district, the Elm Street Extension. The, the only thing that would be regulated is buildings within sight of the main thoroughfare, which would be Round Hill. Uh, would Adams, Coolidge, and Skinner be exempt? Would they be outside the uh, regulations? So the area better than these have to call it. You can see them. You can see them, but they're they would not be because there's a there any time there's an access road will also apply. So there's an a, there's a what could be considered a two-lane access road. So I don't think there's a building except for the heating building, which is not visible. Every other building is visible. And as far as the National Register, uh, we obviously did all that work before we put in a bid, and all of these buildings are eligible. Oh, great. Okay. Well, that's why your, your Bancroft would be eligible, because you're not visible from Round Hill Road, but which would be in the district, and your public way is Bancroft. I so see. That's but again, even if a building is, is regulated, it doesn't mean all the facades of that building are regulated. So, you know, many of the buildings that are right up to Round Hill, the rear of them may not be visible. So, is there any reason why the city council could not uh, enact the expansion of the historic district and then <coughs> continue to engage in a negotiation process with, with the owners, with owners of the park? Um, and if they reach agreement on a historic preservation restriction that really works and provides the certainty that both sides want, um, then repeal that expansion of the historic. Yeah, that's not impossible. You know, obviously the question, you know, the balancing act is to what extent does district stop the investment you want to get? The other thing is the process is just slow enough by the time you get comments that there may, there may not, with moving the historic district forward without any pause, may still have enough time to do that negotiation. Now, although I mean, but go ahead and enact it, and then subsequently, it might take a couple of years to negotiate a historic preservation restriction. It might be part of the negotiation of the development itself. Yeah. And yeah. then once the development is approved and, there, and the historic preservation restriction is agreed upon, then consider if, if there's no longer a reason to have that expansion of the district because you've accomplished it through the restriction. Right, right. Yeah. You still have to do that. I, I, there's a couple of answers. One is three things. One is yes, that's certainly an approach. The other is obviously if you can negotiate it within 90 days or 120 days, you can do it before the district comes in. The third is when I talk about historic districts potentially scaring away some investors, um, you know, my own feeling is when you have a mature area, a site that's built out, historic districts aren't going to have any negative impact. In fact, they're going to add a lot to the property value. So once the area is redeveloped, Frankly, there's nothing wrong with the historic district that I wouldn't think any property owner would mind. The part that's scary is when you have 100,000 square feet of empty buildings, or whatever the space is, of empty buildings, 
um, some investors walked. You know, we had this issue for North Hampton State Hospital. One of the original investors we wanted walked when the, when the state put it on the National Register. Um, so, you know, that, that's when you worry about losing those sorts of investments. Once it's redeveloped, so if it took two years to solve, probably don't need it two years anyway. Um, this is just a factual comment. I don't want it to sound like an objection. I don't mean it as such. The, your chart showed the uh, expansion of population uh, with the addition of, yeah. the, uh, El of the Round Hill Extension as being 81 people. Uh, that's, that may be true now, but what we're talking about is construction that would add, I've forgotten the figures, 100 some, uh, perhaps as many as 140, I don't remember, but certainly, pardon me? 160. 160? Yeah, you're actually right. You're actually right. See, these are numbers as of today. Yeah, right. I, I say that that isn't an objection because I think that's within existing zoning, so that there's no basis for, for objection to that. But there are implications to that kind of increase in density that have to be dealt with traffic, uh, yeah. water uh, flow, uh, uh, runoff, and so forth. Right, right. Those are all the things that site plan approval looks at for the final right. objection. But just so it's clear, those aren't issues that kill a project. You know, so traffic mitigation, for example, is a matter of what sort of improvements do you need to make so the extra cars the project generates are addressed. It's not a matter of planning board saying no. In site plan approval, the planning board basically can't say no to a project. They can condition it you know, in ways to address all those, those mitigations. I understand. Other comments, questions? Is there anything in the, uh, the proposed, <coughs> proposed restrictions of uh, various kinds that would preclude the developers uh, building new buildings within the zone? Um, not of any of the things we've talked about now. Um, the historic preservation restriction could be... So preservation could. They typically aren't. They typically focus on the building. In theory, they could. Um, and certainly under zoning, in theory, the developer may, you know, would do a master plan for the entire site, and we get approved for that use. We'd have to come back if they change that. Yeah, but they can fill in some of that green space. Absolutely. Uh, I noticed, Wayne, that uh, if I'm looking at it correctly, the uh, soccer field's not included uh, in the proposed district expansion. Yeah. Um, why is that? I forget. Well, it's really sort of what's really visible, what's most important in terms of the core story from Round Hill. So this is really about what's the story along Round Hill. I mean, you know, the district could have certainly been expanded, you know, basically this entire area, not so much Langworthy, but really in every other direction. This entire area is all historic. And so it's really, you know, given limited resources in terms of minister, what's the most important story that's out there? You know, if that wasn't as important, if we want to start doing a district along Crescent Street, that's a different kind of story. Yeah. When you're talking about uh, the preservation restrictions, and a couple of times you said they typically don't cover, you know, X, Y, or Z. But uh, I think that in in our neighborhood, a lot of us are concerned with uh, any way that we might possibly be able to protect the green spaces of the Clark campus. So would there be some means by which the you know the concerned neighbors could let City negotiators know that we would very much like language about green space to be included in discussions of uh, you know preservation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just right over here, the city has what's called conservation restrictions, which is the equivalent for open space that we're talking about historic preservation restrictions, where we basically preserve land forever. We are the city's absolute smallest conservation restriction anywhere is right over here on, on Round Hill. So this is sort of a similar process as it is a redevelopment of one of the earlier properties that Clark surplused. The neighborhood said it's really important that this front yard of this building never get developed. And the city was willing to take a tenth of an acre conservation restriction to do that. So absolutely there's mechanisms to do that. Isn't that a conservation restriction there because there's a necessity that there be frontage for the, the, um, for the building? Well, you wouldn't, do that through, you wouldn't need to do that through conservation restriction. I mean, the conservation restriction was a separate message to say we want to make sure that land never gets converted. You don't, we don't generally, I think it's the only time we've ever done something like this. Right, but that, is a but that restriction can be modified. It is not in perpetuity. No, conservation restriction is in perpetuity. It, it takes a majority vote of CONSCOM, city council, and two-thirds vote of state legislature. I thought I read it and said, it said that it can be... 
CR is, is the closest thing we have to permit. Any other comments, questions? Yeah. Uh, could, you, could you remind us then what the process was to create that tiny conservation uh, restriction? And what, what would you advise people who are concerned about the, the rest of the green space, how to go about doing something similar if, in fact, that's what they feel they want to do? Well, with part of, you know, in this case, the neighborhood said they really wanted to preserve the land. I wasn't at the meeting, frankly, so I, I don't know all the details. The neighborhood wanted to preserve it, and the developer was agreeable to it. Um, I was more involved with the paperwork afterwards. We had to look at it because it creates an ongoing burden on the city. We had to look at it was the, the public good worth the administrative hassle of having this conservation restriction. So if we were, if we were to want the, to try to get a conservation restriction on the soccer field, for example, I know you probably think that's a bad idea. What would we do? Well, I mean, you know, the normal way is to approach the developer and try to negotiate what you can with them. I think from our standpoint, what we hope is the property is master plan. We hope we have some overall vision for where the entire campus is going. So we're not focusing on this parcel versus that parcel. We're focusing on, you know, how many acres is the property we have? About 12 acres. So we're focusing 12 acres and thinking about, you know, what's the story behind it? What's the developer trying to do? Right. And it doesn't make sense. So if the developer were opposed, then there wouldn't be much recourse on the part of the Right. Right. Thank you all for coming. So in terms of time period, everything we do, we're going to post on our website. So if you're interested, that NorthamptonMA.opd site will have the final report and I'll update where we're going. Assuming the commission wants to move forward, there will be another public hearing. If you're notified for this one, you'll be notified for that one. Thank you all. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks, Wayne.